In our introduction talk, we had discussed how there are four main reasons why lung may look abnormally opaque on imaging. Uh, there's a nodule or mass, a uh, phenomenon of atelectasis or fibrosis, consolidation, and an interstitial opacity. For this talk, we're going to be focusing on nodules of masses. Nodules of masses, um, when it comes to um, diagnosis on imaging, uh, can be divided into two buckets, nonspecific ones and specific ones. Uh, to recap, nonspecific nodules and masses are ones where the imaging features um, on your CT scan um, are not sufficient or not specific for diagnosis. And oftentimes, um, some sort of additional work is re uh, required, whether that's a follow-up uh, imaging or something invasive like uh, biopsy. Specific nodules are different in that uh, their imaging features are highly specific uh, for diagnosis um, so that uh, you'll be able to figure out what it is um, even on a baseline um, imaging study. And specific nozzles and masses are going to be the um, topic of this talk. Some principles um, regarding specific lung nozzles and masses. Um, occasionally, um, we're going to encounter a nozzle mass on a CT scan that has enough information within the image to let us know what it is uh, without having to resort to follow-up imaging or some other test. And this can occur with a couple of entities, and it's important to know which ones these are so that when we encounter them, we'll know. Um, just to be clear, um, we shouldn't expect that every time one of these entities occurs, it's going to present specifically. Okay, so for example, uh, pulmonary hamartomas can present specifically, but that doesn't mean that every single pulmonary hamartoma is going to present specifically. Um, now, generally speaking, uh, most of the nodules and masses we'll encounter in practice are going to be nonspecific ones that require a more algorithmic approach that we discussed in the nonspecific lung nodule and mass talk. Um, but occasionally, um, we'll be able to shortcut that algorithmic process uh, that involves, you know, additional workup um, when the nodule or mass is specific. Um, for these specific nozzles and masses, um, there's really not a, a kind of a step-by-step -step approach. It is a kind of um, basically a pattern recognition kind of thing. Um, we have to basically know what these generally look like and we'll, so that we'll recognize them in the future. So I always joke it's kind of like uh, human machine learning. When it comes to... Um, Entities that can present specifically on CT imaging um, as a nozzle or mass, um, there's basically nine that we should be prepared to um, be on the lookout for and be able to handle. And uh, we're going to break them down into four um, categories. Um, basically, three congenital entities, one neoplastic benign entity, three infectious entities, and then two inflammatory non-infectious entities. Starting with the congenital ones, um, pulmonary AVMs, infected pulmonary sequestrations, and infected type 2 CPAMs um, can sometimes present specifically, and we need to be prepared for them. So let's talk about pulmonary AVMs first. Pulmonary AVMs, how do they occur? Well, um, long and short of it is um, usually, um, you know, in the lungs, uh, we have um, pulmonary arteries um, that eventually become um, smaller and smaller arterioles and eventually uh, reach in, um, uh, and feed a capillary bed, and that's drained by small pulmonary venules that converge into larger and larger pulmonary veins. This capillary bed, as we know, is a high resistance kind of pathway. Now, occasionally, something unusual may happen, and there may be um, absence of a high resistance capillary bed between um, a pulmonary artery and a pulmonary vein. So what ends up happening is uh, you've created a low resistance um, pathway for blood to reach from the pulmonary artery to the pulmonary vein. It would be like if uh, in Los Angeles traffic, you suddenly opened a brand new highway between point A and B. You can imagine what would happen. Um, preferential blood flow would go through this lower resistance route. And the vessels which were not really designed to handle such a high volume, perhaps, or pressure, um, fluid pressure within them may begin to stretch. And um, 
you might see a, a bulging, uh, perhaps. And if this phenomenon keeps on um, progressing, uh, flow will get more flow, and which will get more flow. And the vessels coming and going may start having to stretch too. Uh, they'll stretch and become larger in diameter, and they'll stretch longitudinally. And if they stretch longitudinally, um, the amount of vessel between point A and point B are going to increase. And so the vessel will have to take a slightly more serpiginous route. And so this is what we may encounter when we see a PAV PAVM sometimes, um, maybe a bulging area fed by um, large caliber um, kind of tortuous vessels coming and going. But um, that uh, bulging area may look like a nozzle to us, especially on a non-contrast CT. But it will look different in that we'll see large serpiginous or tortuous vessels coming and going from it, which is what lends it specificity when we see it on a CT scan. Um, these PAVMs um, can be divided between simple and complex um, PAVMs. Uh, generally, uh, we'll refer to simple PAVMs as ones that are fed by a single segmental pulmonary artery, um, as opposed to complex ones, which are fed by multiple segmental pulmonary arteries. Depending on the morphology of the PAVM, some may appear solid. Actually, they're actually just a homogeneous bag of blood, technically. And some may appear subsolid. Uh, what's actually going on here is you might be seeing lots and lots of little tiny um, PAVMs all kind of um, clustered together, and it looks like a intermediate density kind of uh, opacity. PAVMs tend to be um, more noticeable, larger, um, more numerous in the lower rather than the upper lungs. And um, we can diagnose them obviously on CT angiography, but oftentimes um, they're pretty uh, noticeable um, on uh, even non-con imaging uh, once they're not tiny. And here's some just examples um, of uh, PAVMs in a patient. Uh, you'll recognize these things that look like, uh, they look kind of like uh, nodules or well circumscribed. Actually, they're just big bags of blood. And many of these you can see have large fat serpiginous vessels um, feeding and draining them too. And so what looks like um, well circumscribed nodules is uh, in this case uh, PAVMs um, and not truly solid, but uh, full of blood. Um, infected pulmonary sequestrations are another thing that can present as a specific mass or that can sometimes present specifically as a mass um, in the lung. Um, to recap, what is a sequestration? Well, pulmonary sequestration is basically um, a primitive area of lung parenchyma that hasn't undergone full differentiation during embryogenesis. And this area of lung will look a little unusual. Um, oftentimes, they'll look kind of bubbly, um, kind of think almost like a, of a dish sponge is what I'm always reminded of. And they're different than fully differentiated lung parenchyma in that um, this, these areas of uh, primitive lung uh, retain their systemic arterial supply. So they get most of their blood flow, not from the pulmonary arteries, but from a systemic sort, source. So from an aorta or a branch off of the aorta. And these have traditionally been divided into two um, categories, uh, intralobar sequestrations and extralobar sequestrations. Um, as we said, uh, these are usually these cystic structures that may look mass-like when they become infected. Um, they tend to be found at the medial lung bases, and there is a slight predilection of one side versus the other, but certainly just because it's on the right side versus the left doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean you're going to ignore the possibility that you're dealing with a sequestration. Now, we mentioned intralobar, sorry, uh, we mentioned that pulmonary sequestrations uh, can be divided into intralobar and extralobar sequestrations. Intralobar sequestrations um, exist within the visceral pleural envelope of a existing normal or existing lobe of lung. Okay. Um, they exist within the visceral pleural envelope. That's why they're intralobar. Um, they often do communicate with the rest of the tracheal bronchial trees, but the um, tree, but that communication will not be totally normal airway. However, this means that intralobar sequestrations can communicate with the outside environment, um, which means that um, they are um, at risk of becoming infected, especially since the airways that um, supply and drain them are not quite normal. Um, 
what's going to be one of the specific features of a intra of a pulmonary sequestration, especially an intralobar one, is the feeding systemic artery. Um, especially on an enhanced CT where the feeding artery is relatively large, um, that's going to be the giveaway. Now, not every intralobar sequestration is going to be uh, going to present um, specifically. In some um, cases, uh, the vessel may be just too small to see, especially if you're dealing with a non-con CT. So um, in affected pulmonary uh, sequestrations, intralobar ones, can present um, specifically, but not every one does. The venous drainage of intralobar sequestrations is through the pulmonary venous drainage system. And the traditional natural history of these is they're often um, um, diagnosed in young adulthood because that sequestration becomes infected over and over and over again. And then the workup usually um, um, uh, lets us know that they're there. Extra lobar sequestrations are a little different. Extra lobar sequestrations exist outside the visceral pleural envelope of an existing lobe. They, they're covered with their own pleura, and they, are, they, they share no communication with the rest of the trivial bronchial trait. So effectively, they don't communicate with the outside environment. They're more likely to be sterile, um, less likely to become infected. Um, because they have no communication with the tracheal bronchial tree, and they're in their own space, in their own visceral pleural envelope with no air supply, um, they'll look like a lactatic lung, uh, basically. Um, you're going to see, especially on an enhanced study, a, a uniform density um, kind of triangular mass or kind of um, opacity that you might even mistake for atelectasis or scar. Like intralobar sequestrations, extralobar ones are going to be fed by a systemic artery. If it's big enough to be visible, especially if it's an enhanced CT, you'll be able to call it specifically. Um, but if it's uh, one where the vessel's too small to see, um, it may end up being worked up as a non-specific um, mass and get perhaps diagnosed once it's been actually resected. The venous drainage of intra of um, intra extra lobar, sorry, the venous drainage of extra lobar sequestrations is different than intra lobar sequestrations. The venous drainage is systemic rather than pulmonary, and so that's one distinguishing feature of extra from intra lobar sequestrations. Um, their natural history or the way they present is a little different um, than intra lobar sequestrations. Extra lobar sequestrations tend to be associated with congenital anomalies more often. And as a consequence, they may be discovered in infancy during the kind of workup for um, what's going on. Um, here's an example of a infected intralobar sequestration. Um, it looks like a mass, but there's a kind of a bubbly texture um, that's associated with this mass, uh, kind of like a, a dish sponge, which is highly unusual. And if we go to the soft tissue windows, um, and we can actually see in this case, there is a blood vessel that's feeding this lung mass that's supplied from the descending thoracic aorta. Highly specific for a mass that is an intra-lobar sequestration, in this case, infected one. Um, this next image is an image of what an extra-lobar sequestration may look like. Um, what we're looking at here, we're looking at that fat triangle at the medial left lung base. Um, extra lobar sequestrations behave a lot like atelectasis because they don't communicate with the tracheobronchial tree, so they don't get the chance of having air introduced to them. Um, they're not going to be a large air consolidation generally because um, there's, they're relatively sterile. They're in their own environment. Um, it's hard to introduce infection into these. If you go to the next image slice, you can just barely make out a, the enhanced blood vessel coming off the aorta feeding this triangular mass at the medial left lung base. This is another specific mass, in this case, an extra lobar sequestration. The final congenital um, entity that could present as a specific um, mass is um, a type 2 CPAM, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. Um, CPAMs are basically an area of um, exuberant overgrowth of blind ending um, Bronchi bronchioles um, or bronchi um, with no um, more peripheral development of, say, alveolar um, tissue. Um, the types of CPAMs have traditionally been divided by the size of the cysts. The cyst size actually correlates with how far peripheral um, the overgrowth actually occurs. Um, 
the more proximal the overgrowth occurs, the larger the cysts, the more distal, um, the smaller the cysts. Now, um, one of these, um, the type two CPAMs, where we're dealing with cysts in the half to two centimeter size um, kind of this, um, range. Um, when those become infected, they can have a pretty specific look. Um, so something that looks like, like this, this is a kind of a bubbly kind of mass um, um, that represents a type two CPAM. And something like this is very, very few options it might be. I mean, I suppose you could mistake it for a sequestration. So maybe they're not entirely specific, um, but especially if I were to see this in an upper lung, um, um, it's very unlikely that it would be a sequestration. And so your diagnosis um, um, in terms of options would be extremely limited. Um, so this is why we consider these to be relatively specific masses. Other types of CPAMs, like type 1 CPAMs, are not um, specific because um, there are other things that look just like these. So here's an example of a type 1 CPAM, where the cyst size is much larger than a type 2 CPAM. Uh, they tend to present uh, with at least one, if not more than one, a large cystic area. Problem is, there's a lot of other diagnoses that can look just like these. Um, examples include uh, laryngotracheal papillomatosis and bronchogenic cysts. So as you can see, type 1 CPMs are not considered to be um, uh, a specific presenting mass. Type 2s can. Moving on. Uh, there is one um, entity in the neoplastic category that can present specifically, and that's a pulmonary hamartoma. Pulmonary hamartomas um, are generally nice, well-circumscribed um, nodules. Um, the lung adjacent is very clean. It's unusual to encounter, say, a ground glass halo around these. Uh, they tend to be um, ovoid in shape. Um, and um, sometimes some of these will present specifically. And what are those specific features? Well, the more lipid-rich ones uh, will actually present with um, macroscopically visible fat inside the nodule. Uh, there's nothing else that will look like this. Um, so if you see a nodule that uh, has macroscopic fat within it, um, that's pretty specific and we'll understand that it's a pulmonary hamartoma. Um, other pulmonary hamartomas may present with a popcorn uh, pattern calcification, which we discussed in our last talk on nonspecific nodules. Um, that's a specific feature. Now, uh, not every pulmonary hamartoma is going to present with popcorn calcification or macroscopic fat. Those are the ones that are going to present nonspecifically. Those are the ones that get worked up as a nonspecific nodule, sometimes um, lots of follow-up imaging, sometimes even an excisional biopsy. Here's an example of a pulmonary hematoma, um, well circumscribed kind of ovoid nodule in the left lower lobe. Um, but something interesting happens when we shift to the soft tissue windows. And we can see that the density of this nodule is equivalent to the subcutaneous fat in the breast tissue. It's because this thing is mostly macroscopic fat. Uh, a nodule that looks like this is highly specific for pulmonary hematoma and nothing else. Not every pulmonary hematoma, however, um, presents specifically. This is a pulmonary hematoma in the right lower lobe. We shift to a soft tissue window. Uh, we can see this a nodule is not um, um, macroscopic fat like the last one that was specific. This one's almost the same density as muscle. This is the type of pulmonary hematoma which is presenting non-specifically, which will eventually require some sort of fault imaging, if not even um, say a PET scan or sometimes a biopsy. Here's another example of a pulmonary hematoma in the left lower lobe, which uh, did not present specifically. There are going to be three entities in the infection um, kind of um, realm, which can sometimes present specifically that we should be prepared to call when it presents that way on a CT scan. Um, some occasions uh, of non-invasive aspergillosis, some occasions of invasive aspergillosis, and the calcified granuloma. Aspergillosis um, takes basically two um, forms in terms of how it infects the lung. Um, there is a non-invasive form which of, um, inv of um, aspergillus infection, which tends to occur in people with uh, normal immune function, or at least just mild immunosuppression. And then there's a much more dangerous invasive form, which tends to happen in folks who are moderate to severely immunosuppressed. Both of these two forms of aspergillus infection can sometimes present specifically um, 
in the lung as a nodule or mass. So non-invasive aspergillus will handle that first. Um, also known by synonyms uh, mycetoma and aspergilloma, um, occur in people with normal uh, immunity or perhaps just mild immunosuppression. The pathology here is a fungus ball, that's the aspergillus um, uh, infection, occupies a pre-existing lung cavity that happened due to some other disease. So in this case, a disease like sarcoid or CF or TB caused a cavity to form the lung and then the fungus sets up shop inside that cavity. So um, the traditional um, kind of classic finding we describe is a ball within a cavity that is potentially mobile if you were to say uh, flip the patient on their, um, their, their anterior side down. Um, highly specific um, for uh, non-invasive aspergillus when we see a mass like this sitting within a cavity. Here's another one. Um, this goes by the term Monod sign um, in some literature. Invasive aspergillus is a different um, uh, morphology or type of aspergillus infection that happens in folks who are very immunosuppressed. In this case, um, we're not talking about fungus setting up shop within a cavity, but just fungus just growing de novo within previously normal parenchyma and not being controlled because the immune system is too weak. And the fungus can grow quite aggressively, invading and disregarding vascular margins, airway margins, hence the term invasive. And this is what makes the infection quite dangerous uh, when it violates a vessel um, uh, um, acutely. Um, invasive aspergillus, um, when it happens, tends to form nodules, occasionally masses, often with a ground glass halo representing a zone of hemorrhage um, around the um, site of infection, um, but generally um, are very dangerous infections. Something interesting happens um, in people invasive aspergillus who have a recovering immune system that begins to attack and address the um, invasive aspergillus infection. Um, in these kind of situations, the nodule may begin to cavitate. And it may in fact begin to cavitate in a very, very specific way that we only see with invasive aspergillus and not in other things that cavitate nodules. Um, what we see during a very, very short period as the immune system begins to respond and attack this site of invasive aspergillus is a, um, is a zone of cavitation in the nodule that forms a very, very thin uniform um, width um, kind of um, of cavitation that looks like the new moon. Um, here are some imaging examples to kind of show you. Some of these pictures are worth more than me trying to talk and speak in terms of words. But what you're gonna see is a nodule or mass with this thin little arc of um, cavitation, um, just like the new moon. Sometimes it's not visible perhaps on the axle. You might have to look at a corona or sagittal to truly appreciate that. But when we see that pattern of cavitation, highly specific for invasive aspergillus. And so um, if, you're, um, if you are able to catch a nodule of this appearance, um, you can uh, very, very much um, be confident that you're dealing with um, you know, something, uh, invasive aspergillus as opposed to the broad range of possible things that could cavitate. The final um, empty um, on our infectious list are just calcified granulomas, pretty common. Um, we know that calcified granulomas can present um, specifically, um, um, and it happens pretty frequently. Um, calcified granulomas that are uniformly calcified throughout same density, or centrally calcified, or have a targetoid calcification pattern, um, these are all benign calcification patterns that are highly specific for a granuloma. So if I see a nozzle that looks like this, um, we can be quite confident we're dealing with a granuloma and not have to worry about um, working this up as a nonspecific nodule. Our last two entities we need to be prepared uh, for that can present as a specific lung nozzle or mass are in the inflammatory non-infectious um, camp. Um, two entities, one known as round atelectasis and then a more uncommon entity uh, called lipoid pneumonia. Let's tackle round atelectasis first. It's the uh, certainly by far the more common of the two. Round atelectasis um, happens um, when um, 
scarring of the visceral pleura occurs um, that causes that visceral pleura to contract. And then the lung parenchyma in the periphery of the lung that's attached to the visceral pleura um, gets kind of bound and restrained into an area of atelectasis that takes the form of a ball. Um, causes of round atelectasis are pretty much anything that would cause visceral pleural scarring to occur. Uh, number one answer, asbestos-related pleural disease, but other things um, can cause round atelectasis because they cause visceral pleural scarring. Um, having um, some scarring post-surgery or perhaps as sequelae of some sort of prior empyema within the pleural space. Let's talk a little bit about how it happens, how rounded atelectasis occurs. And to understand this, we have to kind of think about how uh, visceral pleura may scar in real life. It's actually pretty common um, when visceral pleura scars for it to scar in one dimension, like in this drawing here. And when that happens, um, all the peripheral lung parenchyma that's you know, attached to the visceral pleura will get brought into a single plane, a single band, which we recognize as kind of a, a linear opacity. Um, uh, we'll often call that either atelectasis or scar, and there's really no confusion there. Rarely, however, um, visceral pleural scarring can occur not in one dimensions, but in two. And when it occurs in a centripetal way, centripetal way um, you're going to have a different look to the lung that's being kind of brought together. You don't get a, just a thin band anymore. You get the lung brought into basically this ball um, of atelectasis, which looks like a mass. Um, a mass that's attached to the visceral pleura, obviously, because the visceral pleura scarring is the cause of this. And the blood vessels, which are normally diverging as you move from central to periphery, um, can reconverge because the lung is being brought together at the site of uh, visceral pleural scarring. Um, so much so that it almost looks like a comet tail. And so people often refer to um, the blood vessels and airways converging on this atelectatic ball of um, lung as a quote-unquote comet tail. Um, imaging features we should see with this um, are a kind of a homogeneous mass that has this kind of dome-like appearance um, that's, center, that's touching the edge of the, the, um, the lung where the pleura is, where the blood vessels look like they're reconverging as you move from central to periphery. Um, and oftentimes, uh, when round atelectasis occurs, it can occur like in these examples, in a way that's pretty specific. Um, there are certainly going to be cases around atelectasis where uh, you may be on the fence, and those ones will have to work up as a nonspecific mass and usually involve some sort of follow-up and rarely um, much uh, other tests like a PET-CT or even occasionally a biopsy. Uh, what's interesting about round atelectasis is um, many, many years ago, folks actually at one point had actually done animal studies to kind of prove this phenomenon. Uh, what they had done was, um, I think they had worked with dogs. Um, they had tied um, purse string sutures along the visceral um, pleural surface of these dogs' lungs. Um, so you cause that basically kind of um, that two-dimensional kind of retraction of the visceral pleura. Close the dogs back up and CT'd them, uh, you know, some time later. And they were able to reproduce the morphology of round atelectasis when they did this. The last um, entity we have to know about that can present specifically as a mass in the lung is something called lipoid pneumonia, which I admit was a diagnosis I don't think I had heard of until I became a radiology resident. Um, lipoid pneumonia is basically a foreign body uh, reaction um, to a lipid within the lung parenchyma. Um, classically, um, people talk about um, lipid aspiration, so exogenous introduction of lipid into the lung, uh, resulting in basically uh, foreign body reaction and chronic inflammation. That can sometimes be quite aggressive, resulting in this, this weird looking mass in the lung, um, often with some ugly speculated margins. Um, what's interesting about lipoid pneumonia is in cases where the lipid concentration within this kind of area of inflammation, um, when the lipid concentration is high enough, you actually will see um, areas of fat attenuation within this mass. So here is an example of one of those cases. Um, there's actually masses in both the lower lobes in this patient. Um, they look kind of ugly um, on the lung windows, but if we move to a soft tissue window, they take on a very specific appearance as we start seeing 
um, areas that are macroscopic fat within this mass. And something like this is highly specific for lipoid pneumonia. Um, shouldn't confuse us for a hamartoma, which are usually smaller nodules, um, not as aggressive and ugly appearing. Usually those are just uh, a wall circumscribed nodule in a sea of clean lung, as opposed to these guys where there's just a lot of evidence of chronic inflammation everywhere. Uh, but certainly um, probably one of the entities uh, that's you know clearly an unusual look um, uh, that uh, we can usually be pretty specific about diagnosing without having to resort to additional tests. Now, there are going to be cases where the lipoid pneumonia is lipid poor, in which case um, you will work it up as a nonspecific mass. Um, one last point is um, with lipoid pneumonia, um, the lipid um, can be introduced exogenously or occasionally endogenously. And those endogenous cases, usually there's some sort of... Um, um, airway occlusion, and um, I don't know if it's the goblet cells, I believe that's what they are, um, happen in, one, in some patients to secrete just lipid-heavy um, material, and that incites the, um, the lipoid pneumonia. So the lipid doesn't always have to be introduced from an exogenous source, just something to think about. So there you have it, um, a review of the nine entities that we need to be responsible for that can sometimes present specifically on a CT scan as a specific nozzle or specific mass. Um, these are gonna be the situations where we can bypass the algorithmic workup um, for, that we usually rely on for nonspecific nozzles and masses. Um, and you can give a diagnosis now as opposed to after follow-up or after another test.